Hey guys, Buckeye Bar guys. Uh, we wanted to thank you guys for uh, tuning in to us here on uh, Buckeye Bar Talk. Uh, great show we got coming up today. Uh, we're really looking forward to you guys uh, listening and watching it. Um, but just wanted to remind everybody, just uh, remember to subscribe to the channel, hit the all notifications bell, uh, and to, so that way anytime uh, a new show comes up, you guys will uh, be alerted to it. And don't forget to like the video and uh, comment on the video. All interactions with us uh, helps us continue to grow, and uh, we appreciate your support. Now to the show. Welcome back, everybody, to Buckeye Bar Guys here on Buckeye Bar Talk. Today is Saturday, April 3rd, Easter weekend, um, and we are here with a big show. I'm Mike. And I'm John. Uh, like I said, big show today. Uh, we will be talking about a couple press conferences from this past week. Um, then we will discuss uh, this uh, crazy uh, Justin Fields uh, talk that's been happening over the... It seems like it's just getting... Uh, worse and worse from our opinion that uh we've went from uh questioning his throwing abilities to where he now proved his throwing abilities to uh, now now he doesn't have a good work ethic and now that's been walked back some so next week it'll probably be like he actually only showed up for one practice a week or stuff i don't know where half this stuff is coming from it's obviously not coming from inside the ohio state program um at least the way you listen to Ryan day. I think if any, if it was coming from inside the program that that person might be looking for a, a new job. If uh, like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, we'll talk about that more a little bit. That's just, they're terrible takes. So, I mean, yeah. I don't know why, why the media is so out to get this kid. Yeah. And then speaking about pro day, we'll talk, uh, we'll talk a little on pro day. Uh, the Ohio state pro day was this past week. And then we will finish it up on our linebackers discussion uh, as we uh, were going through position group by position group for spring football. Linebackers has been a big one we've wanted to talk about and we are here. So um, let's get going. Uh, anything you want to throw in before we start? You know, I mean, pretty good week. <laughs> Yesterday I was off. Good Friday. So uh, long weekend. Excited for the holiday. And no, I'm good. Let's get into it. All right. So press conference time, uh, I think we'll uh, start with uh, the cornerbacks. Uh, so we actually had three press conferences uh, this week. We'll focus on the last two. So we had a defensive backs press conference the other day. And then uh, yesterday we had Ryan Day had a spring, uh, just a quick like 16 minute press yeah. conference. So uh, we'll go with those two. So uh, uh, you kind of want to talk about uh get us going on the defensive backs yeah so matt barnes he had uh if i mean i'm sure most people know but matt barnes is now the secondary coach he was uh safeties and helping you know carry combs before he was a special teams coach but he has been promoted to all secondary uh as carry combs is going to focus more on just being a defensive coordinator so that's very exciting for him well i was i mean that's exciting for him i'm happy about that too i think it's i think it's the best for the team combs needs to uh, you know really especially if, if you're not gonna have a co-coordinator in there you good to kind of start just i think i mean on. i think what's important if it's your first time you know being the coach of the entire defense you need that time to be able to look at all yeah. you can't be distracted with coaching your own position group on that. Yeah. So I think it is a smart move for Ohio state. Uh, and I think that's, it's going to pay dividends. I think, you know, Combs is going to be able to focus on the defense, get a better scheme implemented. Of course, you're going to have time this year to actually work on the fundamentals of your scheme. So I think it's just going to help everyone else. So I'm yeah. excited to see it. I think Matt Barnes is, you know, he proved he did a great job on special teams. He's been a good recruiter since he's been here. Um, so I think, and they want the culture to continue to, row so i think he's earned the right to be promoted so i like it um he did he got an asked question though about you know his past with special teams and where he is now moving forward and he is he let everyone know that he is going to still be involved with special teams in some regard it's parker fleming's show he got promoted that special <clears throat> teams coach but he is there to help him out um just give guidance you know his experience with it and he's still assisting with that area. Um, they asked them, you know, about Carrie's position with the defense. We already talked about that. Carrie's going to be a bigger picture guy, that he is actually the coach of the defense now. He's not the coach of the defense and the coach of the cornerbacks. Carrie's going to have time to actually be able to look at all position groups, not have to focus on one during practice. No. I think that's going to be super helpful for them. I will say Barnes. <clears throat> he was a little vague 
in the press conference. So I mean, and especially this time of year, I mean, the guys are pretty vague anyways. Like you get great interviews, but they don't ever tell you a lot. I, I, I think I, I, I saw that too. I think the kind of just, I mean, you might be getting ready to hit on it. Just like this, the jump in that uh, I think he, uh, I mean, he has never really gotten to talk a lot to begin with. I mean, yeah. he's always the one that talked the least out of the whole group. I mean, they, they have actually a lot of polished coaches on the staff. I mean, you think about LJ and Alford and, uh, you know, Heartlines, but Heartlines, I mean, Heartlines had to speak to people now forever. I mean, right. he was a pro and now he's a, a coach. So, I mean, he's used to the press. Right. Uh, Brian Harley knows how to talk. Uh, Al Washington's now been around the block for a while. So, like, these guys are more polished interviews. I just think that they're more used to the camera. And so I think that has, I think he'll, it's a thing that he'll get better with as he gets right. more opportunities. And I mean, was he, was he special teams at Maryland also? I think so. I think, I just think he, uh, he, so I don't think the special teams coach at Maryland was getting a ton of like, you know, yeah. talk time. And he probably, he probably doesn't realize, I don't know how long his leash is. I mean, I I'm, I'm assuming Ryan keeps him on the same amount of leashes, all the other coaches. But internally, he might not realize that yet. So he, he has to kind of get more used to maybe the media and thing. Like, uh, you know, I think the other guys, they know they've been around for so long. They know what they can say and what they can say that before, you know, your boss gets mad at you for right. saying something. So, I mean, I think they understand what they can throw out there, what they can't throw out there. And he probably just needs, I think he's just being ultra conservative, ultra protective of what he's saying. And before I actually dive more into this, I, is this the most that you can remember? Cause I know like you personally, you, you watch more of the press conferences during the trestle era than I ever did, or at least you listen to them. Um, I mean, I think we both followed Myers stuff pretty closely. Is this the most that the assistant coaches have ever talked to the media? Yeah. I mean, I mean, granted, I, when trestle was the head coach, I mean, that was still early in the early days of, you know, I mean, he, he social media. He, he didn't have any assistant yeah. coaches they wanted to talk to. Social media. And I mean, I'm sure that they were brought out there, but now there wasn't, you know, the there wasn't Buckeye Scoop and Letterman Road that were putting everybody's press conference. Right. On. Like if, you know, I mean, I've been a member of uh, where a lot of, uh, I've been a member of, you know, Buck Nuts, the Ohio State 247 since I've been in college. So. Right. I mean, that's been around for a long time. I've been a member of the, their site for a long time. Um, and like, I remember, you know, when Trussell would speak, you know, they would put up the video of Trussell and the bullet points, but Hellwig and when the other coaches, was, he would just put up like, you know, bullet points. And that's nothing about what Steve would do with, you know, that's just how they did it. Right. It was not, right. You, they, were, they didn't weren't wait, wasting video time on assistant coaches, especially because a lot of times the coaches only talked for like 10 minutes yeah. and there wasn't a big press conference to go with it. And it's just different now. I mean, you have to be much more media savvy. You have a, not only do you have the, t the old school TV world, you also have this, uh, the social media world, you know, there's 24 seven sports. Now it's not just ESPN anymore. There's other channels that are around. So it's just, it's a whole different kind of uh, media type thing. So yeah, this is probably the most that they've ever spoke. And the reason why I think that is that it wasn't as big as a deal when Trussell was the coach that they did speak. And Meyer, I think Meyer's philosophy on coaching is that everything was funneled through him. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, he, I think he let the leash go a little bit on some coaches as they got more experience. I mean, I think he trusted LJ more than, uh, you know, somebody else on the, you know, on the staff would have right. been trusted. Uh, like, I don't ever, I don't remember ever, you know, you know, some of the other offensive coaches really coming out much like the offensive line coach. Warner never spoke a lot. And, you know, yeah. uh, Zach Smith, I mean, you know, not getting too far down that rabbit hole. He didn't talk a lot. <laughs> he didn't talk a lot either. Uh, you know, so, and I think, I think Ryan day, talks a lot now. I think Ryan day. Yeah, he does. He has a good podcast. Uh, Ryan day. I just think is more, uh, it's just a different mindset. He just, I think he lets the guys talk a little bit more. It's supposed to be, I think it's a, he's the top guy. He's the top talk, but it's all more of a collaborative process. Yeah. And, you know, everybody's got their says and everything. And he makes the final decision on that. Say where I think Meyer said that there's a lot of collaboration that went on, but you know, I, he, he was just a different type of coach. And I think it's his opinion I just, I, I mean, I enjoy it personally because I think they all have like a lot of great things to say and it's cool hearing it from them too. And, 
you know, Carrie is such a good press conference anyway. Yeah. Larry Johnson, such a good press conference. Um, of course, Heartline, you know. So I really like that since Dave's been coach, it seems like those guys are a little bit more front and center. Yeah. Because it's nice to hear what, you know, their personal updates with the team. Um, now going back to where we were before the little tangent. So of course, you know, what we were getting towards, he's, there is no depth chart. He said, guys are working at different positions. You know, they're finding the best fit for everybody right now. Um, he did say that, you know, a lot of it right now is technique that you can teach, you know, scheme scheme comes along. People will learn the scheme of the defense, but they need to know how to turn their hips quickly. You know, they, they need to learn the technique yeah. and the fundamentals of what they're doing. That's the most important thing right now is getting guys in a position where they, and we had talked about this weeks ago, that it needs to be a reactive move that you know what to do and you do it correctly, that you're not thinking about it as you're playing. So yeah. he said that's what they're really drilling into them right now is just getting that technique down. Scheme will come when it comes, but the most important thing is getting guys in the right position and getting them playing well. Um, he had mentioned both Lath and Ransom and Cam Martinez. Now he was asked about both of them, yeah. but he did mention that they were both doing well and they're both working at multiple spots and they could really do, you know, anything on the defense. Um, let's see. He said a lot of um, the bullet position he had talked about. He said right now it just, and then like I said, it's kind of vague. He just said that, they really don't know what's going on with the bullet that, you know, is it a Sam out some plays is a bullet out there. Some plays they're not a hundred percent sure on that is really just going to depend on this, you know, yeah. down, down distance situation that they're facing at the time. Um, and you, you actually had brought up about like Larry Johnson talking and Larry Johnson being more trusted. So he actually, he did drop Larry Johnson's name in this as well. Um, he, they had asked him about, you know, recruiting that, how he feels about recruiting. He, you know, I think it was like Johnson Dunn that he had really like locked him up and he, they were just asking him, you know, how he feels if he's more involved with recruiting or not. And he says, ultimately, you know, he, he loves, you know, he talks to the kids, he does the recruiting, but if there's someone that if he needs to drop a name or get one of the more established guys in there, bring them in to have a conversation. He's like, if I'm recruiting a defensive lineman, I'm going to have Larry Johnson make a call to the kid. Also, yeah. like, He's like, I'm not just going to, you know, I'm going to get everyone involved that needs to be there. And he said, it's really, you know, the brand sells itself. He made that very clear. He said it a couple of times, which I think you and I, I mean, we've said that. Oh, we've said that. We've year. said that for years. Oh, yeah. I mean, even when, you know, and there, there's a lot of comparisons that go on between uh, Trussell and Meyer as recruiters. But <clears throat> even Trussell, I mean, Ohio State gets you in the door. And then what do you do while you're in the door? And, you know. Trussell did fine in, in that type of things. Meyer is a much more bigger, well-known name. So maybe he got a little farther once he got in the door with mm -hmm. some of the top, top guys. But uh, again, Ohio State gets you in the door. I don't care what number, if, whether you're the top player in the country or the last player rated in the country, Ohio State's going, you're going to listen to Ohio State. Right, right, right. Lot. Absolutely. And then, I mean, to sum up, and there's a couple of things that, you know, I skipped through, but he's, he was asked his last question was actually about Denzel Burke, who um, I believe he was more so of an offensive player in high school. He just said how amazing he is, how like quickly that guy has shown though, like that he's ready to be a cornerback. Say like he didn't know if it was maybe he worked on defense a little bit like seven on seven camps or something like that. But he was just very impressed with how far along he already is. But he still has a far way to go. No. So, I, I mean, I thought it was a very interesting press conference is good. You know, always to get those guys that haven't really done a bunch of them to get them in front of the cameras and get them more comfortable, get them used to it, hear about where the team is. It's still so early in spring, though. You're not going to get a ton of answers about who's playing where or depth char, who's one, who's two. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so I mean, your opinions, do you think? Like, I was a little hesitant that I didn't hear more about other guys you know we didn't hear a ton about like they asked them specifically i think about like legend and ryan watts how important it was to get them acclimated and he kind of turned that to well it's important to get everybody acclimated yeah so i mean is there any concern that you think that they don't have anyone like standing out right now or you think he's just being vague to be vague no i think he's just being vague i mean we vague. learned we learned that seven banks is injured, yeah that he's so not practicing right now i'm gonna we're gonna talk here in a second about on the day press conference um but um, cause he does talk a little bit about defensive backs in there. Um, 
I think he's just being vague. Uh, you know, we know Cam Brown's still out. We know Seven's now out. Um, and from when you listen to Day Talk, uh, there's actually been a lot of guys that have, uh, a lot of the young guys are showing up. It's just they're, they've never had to do, they've never played in college football yet. So, you know, they're, they're just, everybody's just trying to show off and, uh, you know, get noticed. And it seems like a lot of them are getting noticed. It's just now, you know, trying to get them actual real reps eventually and stuff because, you know, they've never had to see it before. And, you know, practice situations are a little different than game situations. Um, but, you know, you, you show off in practice and then you prove yourself in games and they haven't had the opportunity to prove some prove themselves yet. I'm interested to see where a couple of these freshmen and sophomores where they can end up once the season <clears throat> starts and they could go ahead of some of these older guys. Um, and we'll talk. I mean, we're actually we'll break down the defensive backfield next week. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunities in this. Uh, you know, there's you know, they there was a lot to be desired from the secondary at different points last year. I mean, I know it's a weird season, but you know, the transition from just the powerhouse defensive backfield with Akuda Wade and um, uh, Damon Arnett from the year before, it just, it didn't, uh, they didn't get, I think what they were expecting to get didn't translate in the field. And then as COVID issues and injuries, as the year went on, then it just got worse. So the, I think the added depth is going to be nice. Um, there's a lot to talk about, about, um, you know, Tyreek Johnson, um, you know, can he take a step, take a step forward? Are one of these guys behind him going to now push him out of, to push him to the side. And so, yeah, there's a lot to go through. I'm, I'm looking forward. It was nice here in the secondary. I think we have now a kind of a, a blueprint where we want to go next week when we start breaking that stuff down. Do you think so? Sean Wade and I just sorry, just popped in my head. Sean really never got to do what he was recruited to do at Ohio State, not till the very end, yeah. right? So, I mean, because he was hurt, then they needed him to play safety, then they wanted him at that slot cornerback position, then he finally got the lineup on the outside. So, Marcus Williamson, he dealt with a lot of injuries coming, you know, going into last year, but Marcus Williamson, at least he he worked as an outside cornerback up until that point. And we actually, in the, I saw a couple of spring games. He looked pretty good. Now yeah. he never stayed healthy. I mean, do you see a, a chance of, of any opportunity that, you know, maybe Cam Brown is actually a better fit in the slot cornerback and Marcus Williamson moves outside? Or do you think like last year, I mean, Sean did good last year. I don't know why everyone's deal was, but he obviously, you know, he didn't look like Jeff Okuda the year before. Yeah. Do you think they they don't want to mess with that again, moving the slot corner back to the outside? I don't know. They probably, if they feel, if the, if the coaches feel more comfortable that Marcus is a better slot guy and Cam's a better outside guy, then I think they need to go with what their gut's telling them. I think Marcus could play the outside, but now I think there's, more depth on the outside than we necessarily had last year. So I, I think maybe, you know, I think he showed a lot of positive stuff last year doing the slot thing as the season went on, you know, yeah, I, I mean, he had some rough games, he had some rough games, but I thought he got a little bit better at different spots Um, where I think there were spots earlier where it seemed like the game, the majority of the game was more rough than it was. And now I think, uh, I think that maybe they should keep going forward with that because I kind of think of guys like, you know, when you think about like Gary and Conley and when you can't judge them necessarily from the year before, because you could be going from uh, you're taken out immediately against Michigan state because you let them easily score to the next year. You're one of the best lockdown corners in the country. Well, right? Especially the year after that, you're a first round draft. Yeah, pick. So like he got his practice. He got beat a lot. He showed some improvement throughout the year. He, uh, so let's see if he can take that to the next level. That'll be an interesting spot next week when we're talking. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that, I mean, that was pretty much it. Like I said, he didn't say a ton, but it was always good. It's always good to get these guys in front of the camera and talk and definitely feel like, you know, if getting a full spring is going to be very important for the secondary this year, Yeah, probably more so than 
any other year besides last year. Last year would have been great because, you know, they, they really needed that last year yeah. with Halfley leaving and Kerry <laughs> coming in. They really needed. Yeah, and I think that's they the, really needed a full spring. List. That, and we'll talk about that next week, too. That's the, I think that's the biggest thing that they just never got. the They never got what they needed in practice time to really be prepared for a season. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. So uh, Ryan Day, then he talked yesterday. Um, he had a, a quick 16 minute uh, press conference. Um, you know, I mean, he just kind of went down some of the stuff with the spring. Um, I I think his most interesting points were his last question and then the first two questions. Yeah. So the basically his first two questions surrender surrounded around uh, G Scott and um, uh, Demario McCall. And so Scott, you know, came to him and wanted to work with the tight ends it was kind of his idea and uh then demario has been working with the secondary so first on uh gee i personally think it could be a really good idea and i mean i know he has to gain a little bit more weight um you know is he the tallest person in the world when you compare him against other tight ends no but you know he's still i think he's got a good frame on him and obviously they think that he's got a frame that can add weight to be a tight end. And everybody knows my feelings. I mean, I'm over our 41 episodes that we've done before this point that I've talked about tight ends. Well, I love tight ends. Um, tight ends mismatches are one of the things to, to me that just doesn't get exploited enough in football. And at least uh, not by Ohio state. Yeah. And a lot of teams too. It's like, especially in teams, uh, more talented teams. It's like, you know, they forget that, you know, they might have a just as talented tight end as they do receivers. Right. And it's like, you know, you also have the number one tight end in the country or a top five tight end in the country. Use that kid. And, uh, cause I mean, he's a beast and you got uh slow linebackers and uh small, uh, safeties trying to cover him. Yeah. And, um, so, I mean, this kid's a receiver. He's going to have receiver, receiver like speed and you, get another 15 you know 15 20 pounds on him i mean he could be a terror to deal with you know as uh, oh yeah as a tight end so i was really excited to hear about that I, especially because you know we the the room is uh with feral leaving uh it's not as uh um there's not as many bodies in that room as there was last year so. right well, yeah, and, a proven guy. And Hausman's gone too. So yeah, that's right. Hausman left. You got a very, and that's another thing is right now this. I mean, <clears throat> I, the thing is, he said G approached him about it. So obviously, that's something that he wants to do. That's a long term plan. I I think it could work out. I mean, yeah, you might be three inches, you know, two to three inches shorter than what your average tight end is. But still, if you're a mismatch in the middle because of your speed, you're a mismatch. Like you know, yeah. if a safety's on you and they're not big enough to cover you and they're slower than you are, or a linebacker is much slower than you are, then, yeah, I think it's going to be very helpful. Um, it definitely, it adds some depth. It's probably going to be a project. I don't know how much we're going to see it this year. So everyone that's like, oh, you know, we're going to have the biggest mismatch ever in tight end this year. You still do. Jeremy Ruckert's amazing. Yeah. So, but well, and that's but you might not be seeing a lot of G. It might be more so um, Kate Stover and well, I, I Jeremy Ruckert. I do think, though, with that, we could um... – there is opportunities because now they can kind of run that 12 offense that they've liked to run so much on your Ryan day at different times where you have two tight ends in the game and they, um, you could put him where you put him in with Rucker and now, you know, I mean, your best guy that you are designated in the cover a tight end is going to Rucker. So, right. I mean, now you got even a bigger mismatch on somebody who's basically a wide receiver. And you think about it, you have, so have two receivers in there. So you got, Alave and Garrett Wilson in there, and then G. Scott. I mean, in record, I mean, he could be a forgotten man that could really put up a lot of stats. Right. I mean, you saw against Clemson, he was, you know, that's they yeah. they went to the tight end for three touchdowns in that Clemson game. No, so I mean, I'm all about this. I uh, I definitely I I like this move. I I I like this move more than I'm liking the move that we're going to talk about here in a second. Because uh, I, I mean, I don't. I mean, I have some thoughts on Demario on that. I just, I don't know if that will work necessarily, but uh, yeah, especially, I mean, there's, I mean, I think, I think we both agree. G Scott, especially because he's so young still. I mean, he's only been in the program for a year. So, right. I mean, he's got a couple of years now where he could really, if this is a true path for him, if this is a path where he think he could really become one of those uh, 
those uh, hybrid tight end receivers that are big deals in the NFL. I mean, good for you. Let's go with it. Let's see where it takes you. Um, Demario. And it's not so much against Demario's talent level. Um, You know, I mean, the kid's talented. We know that. I mean, he's been talented when I I wish that they would have used him more over the years as a running back. Cause I, you know, he could have like, that was, during the national title game, I mean, I was happy Marcus Crowley, you know, got to go in for a couple of plays, but I was like, man, like, let DeMario get a yeah. couple of runs here. DeMario, he's always ran a lot more powerful than what he looks. So, I mean, he's never been afraid. To, when the, they've actually let him run, They've ne- he's never been afraid to go in between tackles. He's never, I mean, and I mean, I'm not saying that makes any much of a difference with that against Alabama that game I mean I, our biggest issues were you know some of the there was some defensive issues I think at the end of the day well, I, I mean <coughs> where the, but maybe we're they, more they were stuck a little on the being able to run yeah the maybe too. we're a little bit balanced more balanced on offense and that opened some stuff up um but you know I've not I sometimes for his for his I think as confident as he is running the ball and I wish he would have shown him more he's never been as confident in the secondary or not in the secondary in the special teams in my opinion he's made a lot of boo-boos over the years in the special yeah. teams thing there's just too much technical stuff that goes i mean not everybody is chris gamble where you could just and even that i mean chris gamble it was when you when you think back to him when he ends up coming in halfway through the o2 year i mean trestle's talked about this before it was like literally we just told him just stick to the receiver, you know, well, use your God given talent and don't just don't let and the guy you're on. Don't worry about anything else. You just stick to him like glue. It was and, a different time of football too. You yeah. know, that was your number ones are six, three, six, four guys that were mismatches and big, and they try to run by you. And, you know, it wasn't now with, you know, the spread that everybody runs your number one guy might be a six foot guy that they have motioning all over the yeah. field and doing different stuff with routes. And yeah. So, I mean, I'm not saying that Chris Gamble didn't have to go up against some really good wide receivers in his time at Ohio and he State, got, and but he, it was a different game. And he was a lot better on a lot of the technical stuff the next year. Oh, absolutely. And you know, he, that's why he played in the NFL for as long as he did as a quarterback, because he learned that the, they weren't expecting him to learn that in the O2 season. I just, for I the, mean, who'd he stay on in the Miami? Was it Andre Johnson? Yeah, he was on Johnson. So, and he did good. And Johnson had a good first quarter, and that was that it. Was he, it. Was, he was pretty quiet. <laughs> I think he, his next catch, he had a couple catches in the first quarter, and then his next catch was until, like, overtime. Did uh, he have another catch? I think he had one catch. I think Kellen Winslow, <laughs> Kellen Winslow had a bunch of catches in that he had, game. Uh, it was either in the fourth or quarter or overtime, but I remember them saying it, without saying it, we haven't heard, said his name since the first yeah. quarter. And so, I mean – it was just you're and you're right on it. It was just a different game. I to me, Demario's been too long in the program now, doing what he's doing as this hybrid running back receiver and special teams guy. To to me, to be able to ever really pick up on any of uh, college level technical abilities. Uh, Is Demario McCall physically big enough to be a cornerback or nickelback at Ohio State? Uh, Is he tall enough to I, do it? I don't know. And I know we just said, like, for G. Scott, you know, if he's a couple inches shorter than your average tight end, it's not a big deal. But I mean, I know I know Williamson's not a tall dude. Um, he's still, like, six foot, 5'11", I think. I don't think he's – I mean, DeMario's not even a tall running back. Yeah. I don't know. I just – I don't – I don't see the fit there. Um, I mean, I could be wrong. He could be showing a lot of stuff uh, in spring and – you know, they might just be trying to work him around. I mean, maybe they are trying to help him out. Something is like, you know, get him a couple more skill sets that, you know, he can go on to the next level with, uh, you know, he can be maybe a player that say, I can do a lot of different things, you know, at least give me a chance somewhere. I just, it just popped <laughs> in my head. Maybe they're like, well, he's not much for fielding. So maybe he'll be good at knocking them down. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, hey, he, Demario is scary catching the ball out of the backfield. Yeah, I I like Demario. That guy's like lightning in a bottle. Well, Demario is really good at an offense. I mean, let's be fair, and this goes all the way back to Byron. They have never given him enough opportunities. He to, needs to touch the ball. Like he has been, he's been good running the ball. He's been good out of the backfield catching the ball. He's been okay in slot receiver I mean, wasn't, duties and, wasn't his first game in college against bowling green didn't he have like a 50 yard touchdown or something yeah that game? and i just think and then he had one like three years later and i think that's been it i don't know what his what his practice what he's like in practice i think some of his boo-boos on special teams has kind of gotten him in the doghouse a couple times and um you know and that's just no 
Well, I, I just, think it's unfortunate that he's uh, not a returner. That's just he's not. I don't think he was ever really comfortable with that. They just they wanted to get him on the field. Yeah, they were hoping that his speed would take over. I think he's comfortable on offense, and I just I don't see where this transition is going to work. I know they might need right now a couple extra bodies, and that's all I think this is right now. Let's just put. I mean, I know he said that he would do it. Um, I think. I think G was probably much more enthusiastic about being a tight end than Demario is about being a, in the secondary. But I mean, Ryan Day did say in his press conference that they don't force anybody to do right. you know anything that they don't want to do. So obviously, I, and I believe him when he says that. Uh, I, I obviously Demario wants to do this. I think Demario wants to help the team. I mean, I think he's a team player. He wants to help the team win football games. I don't think he's a selfish guy sure. in any stretch of imagination. I mean, he he's goes out there and do special teams. I mean, sometimes and, and by all means, if he's the best nickelback on the team, get him on the field. Yeah. If he ends up being the best guy, no, I'd be a little scared if they came out and said to Mario, I would have to see that on the field. If that's <laughs> right. uh, if, if I, I, I can't just take someone's word for that one. If they come out and say to Mario is our best nickelback, I'm going to have a heart attack until I actually see it. The, the, in my eyes, that I'm, that's, more, I'm more concerned of the condition of that secondary, <laughs> the state of the secondary yeah. than I am uh, thrilled to see Demario on the field. Yeah. At that point. Um, all right, but so we'll move on here. So um, somebody asked uh, Day about Alave. I guess he didn't practice. Uh, he just said he was a little under weather. Um, he says there's some illnesses that are not COVID related. And everybody is still getting tested for COVID um, that are just going around the team. And they said that they give him a day off to, mm-hmm. you know, kind of <clears throat> let you know let him start feeling a little bit better. Um, they had a nice. They had a sounds like a really nice scrimmage um, yesterday morning or two days. It would have been two days ago. Yeah. So um the thursday scrimmage um or was it yesterday no it was yesterday yeah it was yesterday because they let the media in for like and then the 15 minutes the day's then, press conference yeah. was afterwards okay so yeah so it was yesterday um they said they did about um basically they did like five spurts where they would do 10 to 12 quick scrimmage plays and then they would get back into um it sounds like that's kind of like their philosophy he talked about he's they're they're having periods of the their practices where it's the four to six a to b let's you know get out there hit people right. all this stuff and move and then they're having teaching sessions and they're trying to mix it as much as they can to get both game reps and you know teaching reps you know to all the players and get as many people reps as they well, need I, and i think that's important and that's something that i i don't i mean i think ryan will be the first to admit they didn't do that last year was it was all just go 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 last year because you didn't know how much time you had yeah. And this year, it's like, even though you're still, you know, go, 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 you're still taking time to do your slow walkthroughs and try to teach guys the fundamentals of the play. Exactly. Um, He specifically mentioned the defensive line and the running backs Said the running backs ran really hard through it. So, I mean, that's excited. I mean, that's one of the battles on the team. I'm sure that they are all playing lights out because, you know, they want to get on the field. And um, so that's exciting. That was one of the things we've targeted as one of the biggest battles into camp. So, you know. And uh, defense line, he said the defense line looked good. Uh, again, it's it, there's a lot of guys there. I think we've expected that. I mean, that's, I mean, when you think about it, since Urban's been the coach, I mean, it's kind of hard to say that the defensive line has not been their best position group, you know, on the field. I mean, and that's not saying anything against any other positions groups. It's just could you have said wide receivers last year? Um, I think I'm just saying in a whole, oh, uh, yeah, it's yeah. a whole, you know, from 2012 on the defensive line oh, has yeah, been yeah, the best, the best position group on the field. And so, I mean, I, I don't have any doubts when they say the defense line, we know there's good players. Right. There. Um, he says he does want to keep on doing these types of scrimmages. He wants to get a few more in before the spring game. Um, he says he feel, you know, he definitely tells you that he feels that, uh, but that's good work for them. That's the actual team drills that, you know, they're going against other bodies that are from other positions. You're not just going against guys in your own position group. And then, um, <clears throat> then we get on to Justin Fields. All right. So, <laughs> so this is going to take us into our discussion, which uh, we'll try to keep brief. Not, not that we're not trying to give people the information is because we're both kind of passionate on it. <clears throat> And I don't want to start cussing out Dan Orlowski on uh, the podcast. Right. I mean, we're, we'll try to keep it brief, but it's really it's really hard not to get fired up about this stuff and and to keep it brief because it's just like it's coming from different directions. And it's just yeah. from what we witnessed. It can't be further from the truth. Yeah. So. 
before we get into our thoughts on it, just basically what Ryan and when Coach Day said about it is that, <clears throat> you know, I mean, Justin has always, he came in, he transferred because he wasn't getting his opportunities down at Georgia. He was not, I mean, you could say that, yeah, he was the guy that they wanted to start, but I mean, he had to come in and learn a whole new offense. You know, mm-hmm. Ryan Day's offense is a pretty, uh, everything we've always heard. It's a pretty intensive offense that there's a lot to learn to. There's a lot of subject matter within his offenses. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a lot to learn. So Justin had to come in and learn a completely different offense, be the starter. Um, and he did that. You saw that in the first year. I mean, Justin Fields arguably right there with Trevor Lawrence is the two best quarterbacks in the country. I mean, and I know two is also still playing that season. There's a, there's guys in that season. You, Joe Burrow's there. And, but you don't, I think you, I think there was more upside with Justin coming into the season than a lot of people thought with Joe, but then, yeah. you know, Joe ends up being, I mean, Joe is the best quarterback in the country that year. Joe That's has the, the great, probably the greatest st- statistical yeah. college football season ever for a quarterback. I mean, and, but Justin's right up there. He's not, uh, when people are saying that Joe Burrow is better than Justin Fields, that was no shot at Justin Fields. It's just that you know, Joe Burrow had a great season. Yeah. He was better that season than Justin Fields. Justin Fields has a, an amazing season that season. Absolutely. Uh, and what for that, 40, <clears throat> 40 touchdowns and three interceptions. Yeah. And, and for, the three interceptions don't, <clears throat> the last two don't even come to the playoff game. Yeah. And then, what he does last year, it's just such a weird season. He had a good season. Everybody wants to remember the Indiana game second half. And, you know, I mean, he he made a couple boo-boos in the first half too, but they're blowing Indiana out in the first half. I mean, there's no, uh, that game's not even close going into right. ha- halftime. And <clears throat> the Northwestern game, he comes out, he ends up having good stats at the, by the end of the game. I mean, his stats were fine. And, you know, yeah. He had some, no- Northwestern was rough. I mean, yeah. if you want to take one of the two, I would say Northwestern was rough for him. Sure. But Trey Sermon also has 330 rushing yeah. yards in that game. They, at the end of the game, they win. They're the big 10 champ. And he, by looks, two scores, and he looks great against Clemson. He was, so the, the stuff that, uh, we'll get into here about him not being prepared, but basically, Ryan Day says that, you know, he comes into practice last year and comes into the winter workouts. They end up quarantined. He's the one, he said, you know, Mick tells Coach Day that Justin's inspiring him because, you know, he's, he starts taking care of his body in a way that, you know, and changes his diet. He changes his diet. And I'm not getting into the whole vegan, non vegan discussion. I mean, what worked for him worked for him. He ends up becoming faster. He ends up becoming stronger. And he, uh, you know, then he could opt out. I mean, the season is canceled. He could say, all right, I'm not going to worry about this. I'm not, I'm going to get ready for the pros. I'm done. I don't want to deal with the COVID issues. I don't want to deal with the possibility to get in. Even if it was just that he didn't want to get injured, he could have used COVID as the cover and been like, I just don't think it's safe for me to play football. I mean, Micah Parsons <clears throat> did. Yeah. And nobody, nobody, Shaw Bateman did nobody twice. killed these kids this year because of that stuff. Because, you know, I mean, we had a pandemic we were dealing with. So, yeah. And he could have been like, I'm getting ready for the pros and that's it. And all right. Half of Michigan's team did it after yeah. the season had already kicked off. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, he, and then he fights to come back. He, he, you know, he's everybody likes to forget in the national media that it was him and Trevor Lawrence that started the every right. Lawrence ends up becoming the face of it. But Justin was just as much as a part of it. Uh, right. Just, I mean, he goes on national TV. I mean, him and Lawrence were the ones that were on the phone call with each other. And so. <clears throat> right. And that's like not one is not ahead of the other one with the effort to get the season back. Like Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, he, he might have put a hashtag to it. Justin Fields did the petition. Justin Fields was on Good Morning America. Justin Fields worked his butt off to get that season going. Yeah. And then after everything that this kid has been through up to this point last year, he gets a, takes a big hit against Northwestern. He could, at any one point, he's taken some big hits over the years. You know, he could have been like, you know, I'm too injured to go back yet. And, right. And, you know, but he wants to play. I mean, they, yeah, I mean, he took a shot, hurt his back. And, uh, you know, his hip on well, that, that we've which, seen him take a lot. Of, we've seen him take a lot of big hits. How many plays has he ever sat out Two. It seems, I like. mean, how many consecutive plays has he ever sat out? Has he, 
Has he ever not gone back in after he, like, went, he goes the, right back the play in. against Michigan when he hurts his knee? Yeah, he's right back in the next play and you know they throws let, a touchdown. What's the they let Chugs take one snap, right? Yeah. This year against Michigan. Stroud got one snap, right? Yeah, Michigan State. Michigan didn't want to play. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. Not I didn't even mean Michigan State. I meant Clemson. Yeah, this okay. year against Clemson. Yeah. Is it once, maybe two snaps? Yeah. And uh, that's. I don't think he's ever missed three consecutive snaps from an injury. No, the Northwestern, he only sat out one snap. And I think Trevor, I mean, Trevor's just as tough. You know, he had the targeting hits against him and he comes right back in. Yeah. So let's get into this. uh, (laughs) this, uh, So at first, it's that, well, he's just not as a good passer to, you know. He's an athlete. He's 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 not a quarterback, he's an athlete. Yeah. And uh, then they show that not only, I mean, he's Zach Wilson. He threw the exact same routes in him. And, you know, everybody makes a big deal about that one where he, you know, rolled out to the side and hit uh, Alave for a touchdown. And everyone, oh, well, at least he made the same throw as Zach Wilson. Everybody's a big deal. I'm like, that is this exact same play that he was injured against against Michigan. He comes in and runs that exact same play right. and hits he could Garrett do this, Wilson. He could do this in game time situations. And too. Garrett Wilson had a, actually he did have a guy plastered on him, and he was able to get over that dude. And uh, that's Garrett Wilson doing Garrett Wilson. Yeah, things. but it's it, it also great. But throw. that was the back of the end zone. Right. That was a fifty yard th- touchdown pass into the back of the end zone. Right. And, I mean, these are live bullets out there. Yeah. This isn't just going in your shorts against nobody. Justin Fields did that play before pro day against you know in their biggest game of the year against actual like people running after him yeah he and, had, he had, and he had to make a throw he, to the back of the he end had zone. two guys in his face and he throws it to the back pylon to the end zone and the guy was actually in decent position against wilson yeah. so yeah that was a great wilson catch but justin fields got it to where it needed to be for wilson to make that catch he didn't under throw it right exactly <laughs> i know so i mean that's it like he's an athlete he can't throw it. well then i mean you saw his throws he had the best pro day out of all. Yeah. I mean, he was the best thrower out of all these quarterbacks. <clears throat> yeah. I will. I will say before we go further into this COVID, the two people that benefited the mo- most from COVID were Zach Wilson, because he got all this playing time before anyone else even took a snap. And BYU was on primetime games that they would have never been on. Yeah. And Devonte Smith, because if Justin Fields had a full season playing the way he did, Justin Fields would have walked away with the Heisman this year. I have no doubt about that. Yeah, probably. I've been right I, up there. I have no doubt if Justin Fields played 13 games before that Heisman Trophy presentation, he wins it easily. Yeah, and, you know, because at that point, then the, the Alabama guys all screw each other because, you know, there was, whatever votes got taken away, would well, and yeah. Justin Fields would have had the rest of the country unify that, you know, he was the best player in the country. I don't disagree with that. I think that... If Justin Fields played, like, first of all, I think that uh, it would have been interesting. If Joe Burrow didn't have the season that Joe Burrow did, Justin Fields might have won the Heisman the year before. And I know a lot of people think that's crazy because he wasn't even up there. People were just because people ignored the fact how good it was like kind of yeah. they ignored the fact that you're be good, how good Dwayne Haskins was. And been like, you know, when they said that, you know, he didn't deserve the Heisman, been like, what are people watching? I mean, and I don't care how he's looking in the pros right now. I mean, pros in, are in college though. I mean, Dwayne Haskins, I mean, Kyler Murray did a lot more with his feet than Dwayne was able to do. Tua did a lot more with his feet than what Dwayne was able okay, to do. Okay, but but Dwayne had a statistically amazing year. Did like, either one of them throw as better than he did? I mean, I mean, neither one was as quick processing quick he, reads. I mean, he played like a quarterback. Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> And I mean, Kyler's better than him in the pros. He was I the guess, first pick, though. I mean, I, pros are just pros are different because there's so much. I mean, he got drafted by Washington and you nobody right. could say that. Let's see how Dwayne looks. I mean, uh, we'll see how Dwayne progresses the rest of the career, if he can get back on track or not. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, Washington, to me, is kind of a death trap to go do. No. Well, yeah, I, that's just that's the wrong situation for anyone. Yeah. I, oh, I think I mean, we said that from day one when he got drafted there. No. I wish he would have fell further in the first yeah. round. So this whole, yeah, but the whole thing. And then, so Justin ends up having a great pro day, looked really good, shows that he has a great arm. And now somewhere out of nowhere, even though all the stuff that Ryan Day just announced, the kids tried to, you know, get us to play when he didn't have to play. He could have opted out, <clears throat> but now he has bad work ethic. Like, 
Well, and before that, remember the narrative originally switched to he can't go through progressions. He can't do reads, yeah. which obviously, again, proof false. Justin Fields looked off safeties a ton of times. Like if Justin Fields' entire game was waiting for Chris Olave or Garrett Wilson to run straight downfield and he eyed in on him the entire time, he'd have a lot more interceptions than yeah. what he did because the safeties would pick off every play. Yeah. Like that's not that's not hard to follow. And Ryan Day, I mean, Ryan Day answered that. I mean, if you're in your first read, if they're getting open, you're not going to go. Well, Ryan Day else. said, you know, when he said this a couple of weeks ago, he's like, you know, we do design plays for, you know, our first guy to get open. And, you know, so he's like, when you're throwing to Chris Olave or Gerald Wilson, and those are your first guys and they're open. Yeah. You should take that throw. Right. And, you know, he's, was that more on Justin Fields or the more on the fact that his guy's open. So I'm going to go throw it to him. And Mac Jones, who somehow, and, the media people's opinion has gone over Justin Fields in a draft order. I mean, you and I both watched the national title <laughs> game. We weren't together, but we both saw it. Mac Jones makes a lot of quick bubble screens and quick passes. Uh, that that's a first read. That's yeah. a design of a play. I want to see. And yeah, and I, I want to see how, and nothing against Mac Jones. I mean, he had a great season. I mean, I want to see how he translates to the NFL. Because I still don't think he's an NFL quarterback. There's just, some of that stuff, what he was so good at, just we've seen quarterbacks like that. You got to be able to throw downhill in the NFL, and yeah. you you got to be able to get it to. You got to have a strong arm. And well, he overthrew a bunch of people at his pro days. So yeah, so he must have something on his arm. But um, so yeah, so now we're to the work ethic. Okay. <laughs> yes, and now it's Justin Fields and Dan Orlovsky. From what he heard. Not his own, like not anything that he ever witnessed, not that he knew, but from what he heard, he actually used the phrase Justin Fields is a, let me make sure I get it right, last in, first out kind of guy when it comes to, you know, putting in the work yeah. and <laughs> not in game time. And I'm sorry, like, you know, I, I saw Justin running the 40, like, you don't look like that if you don't have work ethic. Yeah. We've heard, I mean, Ryan Day last year talked about how Justin Fields called him at home at different times to ask him different questions about, hey, I'm watching this on film and, you know, this is what I'm seeing, you know, what do I do from here? And, you know, normal quarterback to coach conversations and, you know, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I think I should do. Is this correct? And you, you want to see kids do that. And I don't care how good they are. It's been talked about how much he's he studies, and sure, if if Orleski would have phrased it a different way and said that you know I'm hearing that you know he is really good on A B C and you know he yeah he gets on the field he does this thing he pushes the play he's smart you know that I just from what I heard maybe he needs to do a little bit more study and well that's uh, to me that's, that's a, understandable that's an understandable thing I mean I'm not in the situations maybe he does and for the NFL these guys do need to stay and study more in the field when you hear about Peyton Manning I mean Peyton Manning and uh and um uh, Brady you know they spent most of their days at home when they were at home studying film sure. and you know you're just constantly I mean I mean, have you ever heard about Peyton Manning's? I mean, the dude watched basically film from, you know, sun up to sundown and, you know, and then all through the night. And, you know, so, yeah, it's a different type of level of film study you have to do because you're looking more than just God given talent when you get up to the next level. Right. And I get that. And but that's something like that shouldn't be some knock that Justin Fields needs to drop in the draft like. I'm sure that's all these guys right now. Like Justin Fields team is better than the teams he plays. And, you know, I don't think Justin Fields film studied had anything to do with the result of that Alabama game. So, yeah, I mean, when you get to the next level, sure, you're going to have to, you know, sit around more, watch some film to see what, you know, you're doing wrong tendencies that people, what other people are doing. But Justin Fields didn't one, didn't have that much to correct that he needed to watch. And two is just, Nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, everything that we heard, like work. And the other thing was not only was it work ethic, it was passion to play the game. Like they don't know if he was in it for the long haul. Like all the things we just went over the guy, you know, petitioning to get back on the field. We've seen him get hurt. Like that was not a, 
easy hit against Skalski. And, you know, I, and I thought about this earlier today, probably half of the Ohio State fan base would would have been mad at Justin Fields if he didn't come back in that game. But half would have understood if they came out and said, hey, you know, Justin bruised his ribs yeah. pretty severely. It was like, well, okay, well, he was hurt. He couldn't come back. Yeah. In the game. They would have been mad and they would have, you know, we would have been more mad at Skalski than anybody. Yeah. But he was, he came back in <clears throat> one play later or two plays later, whatever it might have been. He came back in and threw a touchdown. Yeah. I mean, just like to say that he doesn't put in the time and he doesn't want to play the game. I just, I just think it's just bull crap that they're making up. And I don't know why the desire to get this guy to drop in the draft. Yeah. What's that's going on. like, it just seems like there's a lot of ulterior motives on that one. And I don't like that. And that, you know, Trevor Lawrence, and I'm not taking anything away from Lawrence. I th- I mean, it's obvious to me that unless, you know, Urban and Jacksonville surprises the world, he's the first pick in the draft. And, you know, but, you know, he didn't have a great game against Ohio State two years ago. He, you know, he had the big run and but his touchdown passes were all you know, more, short touchdowns. And it was all done yards after catch. Yeah, it had made those touchdowns. And uh and well, I don't know, there might have been another guy in there, but it was, no, it was an ATN, but then um what's his face? The guy that was still on the team this year, Rogers, yeah. he had a big he had a big Yeah, so in at the end of the day, he ends up having a lot of yards against Ohio State this year, but a lot of those were in garbage time. Well, Ohio State had the game wrapped up in the fourth quarter. They, and, and they like he got about probably a third of his yards in the fourth quarter when there was Ohio State had that game won. Yeah, there was no it was impossible barring some sort of complete disaster yeah. from Ohio state's offense. Yeah. It's impossible to win that game. At the point. It would have been, had to have been a complete meltdown to lose that game in the fourth quarter. I mean, we're talking three scores in a quarter. So yeah, I mean, Ohio state would have had, had to have some serious like turnovers that probably had to got returned from the turnover, like a pick six or something yeah. for that game to change. Yeah. So yeah. So, and then he didn't look at it great against LSU last year. And no, uh, he didn't. So, I mean, but nobody's saying that. I mean, those are his three. I mean, the ACC is garbage. I mean, the Big Ten's a lot better than the ACC, and that. Uh, and I want to hear about Notre Dame and stuff like that. They were in it for one season, and you can't. I mean, he carved Alabama up as a true freshman. You can't say that. I mean, people say, "Well, the ACC was good this year." I mean, okay, North Carolina is on an uptrend. I would say. But Miami and Florida State haven't made the progress that they should be making to yeah. get back up into the levels and. So you have North Carolina on an uptrend and you had Notre Dame for one season that you can't Notre Dame is not in your conference. They decided to play so they could have a full schedule because a lot of teams were canceling around the year. They didn't know if they were going to be able to make up a schedule. So we already play half our games against ACC. We'll play the ACC this year because, you know, we need a full schedule. Right. We, we want to play football and that, I mean, that's the only reason why they were there. So yeah, I'm sorry. The ACC is garbage. And he plays garbage talent through the season. So his last three games, I mean, he had some good moments in those games. And I wouldn't say that anything you would say in those three games, if if you're just judging Trevor Lawrence on those three games, which should be the bulk of his things. I mean, how can you say he's a hundred percent better than Justin Fields? I mean, well, that, and that's what my argument, I, I kind of feel the same way. I mean, when the guy's played his better competition, he's played worse. I mean, and then, you know what? It could also be that, his teams like Clemson as a whole can actually be on a serious downward trend right now. Uh, I, I don't think anyone they're just running through the ACC every year. Cause the ACC is so bad. Uh, Cause like I, I had mentioned, you know, he carved Alabama up as a true freshman, but yeah, you know, he's playing better teams. The last two playoffs and he's struggled mightily in his last three playoff games. Yeah. So and what do you th- what's what's your percentage that Urban Meyer shocks the world and drafts Justin Fields one? <laughs> I would say just because it's Urban, it's twenty percent. I mean, yeah, I think I think that would be his second guy. Um, I think he would take um, Urban. I mean, Urban's a very strong-headed man. I mean, we all know that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's his first year as a coach. I think he wants to do this for a while. That I would that's a situation that if you it's smarter to go with the guy that everybody expects and you know, Trevor Lawrence is a good talent. So I think it's probably as smarter as a coach that if you think Trevor Lawrence can do it, take Trevor Lawrence, because 
I don't think Trevor Lawrence, if he is a complete bust, doesn't get you fired in three years. Right. It's that, you know, we took the, you took the guy that you should have took. Now, if Justin Fields ends up being a bust and he drafts Justin Fields, that is a situation where you could get, lose your job in two to three years because it's like, what were you thinking? Right. But and it's just, I don't like you. I just don't get it. Like Trevor Lawrence, you know, in his second year, he threw a ton of interceptions at the first part of the year. This is Justin Fields' second year as a starter. He didn't throw a ton of interceptions. No. He had two games where he threw interceptions in. Yeah. And I just, and I realized it ends up being like two out of, and I, he threw that one against Clemson that was tipped. So three games out of eight that he threw interceptions, he threw interceptions in two games the year before that. I mean, the guy was the number two prospect in the country. He was, you know, number one or two dual threat, depending on what they classified Trevor as coming out in the, in the year they came out together. So five-star blue chip guy goes transfers after his first year, because the genius of uh, Georgia, (laughs) you know, they decided to recruit a five-star quarterback to put him as a wildcat quarterback. So um, he transfers away. He gets to play. He wins a ton of games, puts up a ton of stats has a 70 pretty much for a career very high 60s as far as a completion percentage like you don't get that if you're a first read guy and you're going to tell me that he does not going to he's not going to be or deserve to be a top five draft pick when he's coming out like if if the nfl is looking for what a guy can do tomorrow instead of what he can do for the next 10 years that general manager needs to be fired yeah. tomorrow. That's yeah. That's an asinine stance to have when you're evaluating talent and drafting someone. Justin Fields could probably win enough as a year one starter in the NFL, but what he could do in years two, three, four. I mean, Josh Allen, if you're going to go based off of outside of what they can project to do, that guy had no business being a first round drafting yeah. quarterback. Exactly. Yeah. So. I don't know. I don't think it's, I think the whole, uh, and you know, he walked and Orlowski ended up walking it back he because did. he got, got crucified on Twitter and I'm uh, sure my Twitter scared him a little bit. And well, and he also, he also got some stuff to add him thrown at him by Herbie. I mean, it was just, it was a dumb statement and, uh, that, you know, and some of the, you can't make vague statements like that. I heard he has no work ethic like, and I'm sorry, it's not coming from Ohio state's program. So who are you hearing this from? Like if Kirby smart in Georgia, then you, maybe you need to look into, you know, and I'm not saying sources, I'm not saying that George is the one, but it's like, that's like my first reaction when he's like, Oh, I've been hearing. I'm like, who do you hear this from Georgia? Like, did he call Harbaugh in Michigan? Like saying this, I told you it's Michigan? Guillermo Belichick. He's trying to get him the, dr- <laughs> he's trying to get him the drop in the draft. Yeah, I so. saw anonymous. Yeah, some anonymous guy from Boston. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, Bill from Boston here. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah, it's I don't know. It's so stupid. I mean, we'll get more back into Justin Fields and stuff as we get closer to the draft because we'll have some draft discussion as after spring's over, right before the draft. So, all right, so let's get into just quickly about pro day. Um, Justin Fields looked really good. Justin Fields looked great. Uh, we know Cooper did some. Um, we know Cooper did some workouts with the uh, linebackers. Mm-hmm. Um, sound like Pete Warner had a good dra- pro day. Aaron Browning had good measure. Aaron Browning did really good. Togi I uh, didn't get to his fifty reps as he wanted to. Uh, Got forty though. And you know he's still a very powerful man. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, benching 225 40 times like is I, not an easy feat. I, I saw that somebody, I think it was an it was one of the sp- main the uh, national sports is uh Togi I didn't get to his where he 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 missed short short of where he his goals were. And I was like, still a scary man to go up oh, against. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, I don't know. Okay, he was 10 off on benching 50. Uh well, I think what was Baron Browning? I mean, I can't remember what he ran, like four or five or something like that. I can't remember what he ran. But he had what, like a 10 10 broad jumpers? Yeah. Something crazy. Like, oh, yeah. So, I mean, he did well. And the the craziest thing <laughs> that I heard was really like Baron Browning positioned himself that he's probably going to be the first linebacker drafted from Ohio State, which, I mean, given that, you know, five star talent, he started finally getting some stuff put together no. the last two years, does make sense that, like I said, projection wise, he probably could be better than Pete Warner and tough of course and the next level the one that surprised me though i heard justin hilliard positioned himself to actually be 
the second highest linebacker drafted. Well, I mean, and we, know he did 28 reps. Yeah. I mean, the thing about Hilliard is that he was a legitimate dude coming out of high school. Exactly. He was a five star too. He was one of the top linebackers in the country. I mean, and he just had so many injuries that it was just, he kind of this year in, you know, the end of last year and this year, where he was starting to finally play healthy, mm-hmm. you were starting to actually see glimpses of what he was. Now, I don't know how many pegs his injuries have knocked him down. Oh, over the sure, year. Yeah. You, know, I mean, you can only get injured so many times that really that starts taking a toll on your body. So I don't know how long longevity his pro career could be because I don't know. These injuries could have taken a lot out of his body. Well, I mean, that, those surgeries are, you know, better today than they even yeah, were 10 still, years ago. You it's can like, only get cut you open. You can only get cut open so many times. Uh, that it just does start just taking tolls on you. So I hope he has a great long career because when I, you started seeing it from him, I'd be like, this is the kid. If, if he would have been, if he would have never got injuries, that's a three-year kid. That's a kid that's in and out because he's just that good. And you're starting that you started to finally get to see it. And so I've always, I mean, I have a special place that I always about Justin just because I mean, he just how much he stuck with it. And, you know, just, I mean, he had some nasty injuries. I mean, tore his knee how many times? Oh, I know. And uh, we had Achilles the one year. I think he had a bicep one year. I mean, he literally, these are not easy injuries to come back. These from. are any, these are always all when you consider the worst injuries to a football player, he had literally he had all of them. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, maybe tore a peck. I don't know. Like he had, uh, he had everything. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just horrible, Could but you imagine uh, if him and Dante Booker got healthy careers. Yeah. I mean, that was another a, one. And I mean, he, he never got the flash. Yeah. And it's just, he had a couple times on the field where you could see it that like, man, I wish this guy would have been healthy. At the right. Time. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, all right. So using that, I think we'll go into Let's talk about linebackers. linebackers. So we lost a lot of guys, but we still have a lot of guys there. So we're finally going to get to see, uh, you know, that, you know, Pope and that whole group of uh, linebackers, Gant and uh, Mitchell. There's a lot of guys, man. And now they've had so many guys coming behind them. And it's like, you know, so and those guys have worked hard behind them, too. Like you only hear good things about Tommy Eichenberg and Cody Simon. Yeah, yeah we talked about Eichenberg last week. He was specifically mentioned by Al Washington. So to me, this is on the defensive side of the, this is the most interesting position group. I mean, there's a lot going on in the secondary too. I mean, the defensive line's the least interesting just because, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts there, but we, as we talked about last you know week, these guys, though. you know, these guys, you know, their coach, you know, there's just an order about it. This has been the best position group Ohio state's had since 2012. And defensive line has always been the most with rotation as well. So who we're going to talk about, you know, these are going to be the guys that are going to see like the vast bulk, highest majority of snaps on the field. Yeah. Cause the ro- linebacker room has not had a ton of rotation in game. Yeah. All right. So how do, how, like, how does this ha- work for them? Does, is this, does Mitchell Pope and Gant or is this their finally their time to shine or is it because they got, did they get lost now in some of the shuffle that how the guy and not necessarily on their talent. It's just the guys before them, never left and so that uh, do they get because of that did they get lost and how the guys below them are going to take the spots well i mean <clears throat> i actually i have a big concern with you know was taraja mitchell was he never like was he never actually supposed to be a middle linebacker because he got recruited as one but maybe that's like being the general there maybe just wasn't something he was able to do because I don't think he's even projected to be a Mike anymore. And I have real concerns with, you know, and I, the kid's name says it all like tough Borland was as hard as they come, but I don't understand how someone couldn't get him off the field. And some of the things about tough, that's some my- of the issues. Now, a lot of people always like the lump Warner and with tough, there was a couple of times early in Warner's career. There was that I got upset with Warner, but, as Warner's career got on, I, I realized that he was not. Well, it was never anything that Pete Warner was not slow. He wasn't that it wasn't. He wasn't athletic enough. Yeah. He might have been out of place sometimes. I, I love Tough Borland. You saw it on special. The teams. thing I love about Tough Borland, though, is that he is as old school of an Ohio State linebacker as you can get. 
The problem is we're not playing Wisconsin type football every week. Like I, yeah, the Andy Katz Warriors and the um, you know, I can't think of the O two linebacker right now. The well, well, um, the Wilhelms, the the Katz and Warriors, the even um, you know, the the Hawks and Carpenters group with Schlegel. Schlegel, yeah. yeah. So the those are guys, and you know, and Har- Hawk and Carpenter had some great as outside backers too. They had some good, you know, pass catch or uh, pass defense skills, yeah. but it was still different football back then. That you know, if you think about you know linebackers now, those outside backers, they're just bred different. And they actually are better pass defenders for the most part than yeah. even those guys were. But the middle linebackers, you played more team. The teams you played in the Big Ten were more like Wisconsin than they were like other than they were Northwestern. And, you know, Purdue, when you think about those, these aren't Randy Walkers and um, the Purdue coach. What's I can't think of his name right now. Uh, Tiller. Um, these aren't Tillers and Randy Walkers, yeah. you know, Purdue teams. You have more of those now in the Big Ten than you have Wisconsin style. And back then you have you had more Wisconsin style. Michigan was more Wisconsin style. So those guys. That's why some of the tough Borland's best games have always been against Wisconsin. Right. Cause they'll, they try to run at him and, and he can come up, he can come downfield and smash the running back right. in the hole. And doesn't and, matter if it's Jonathan Taylor or not, he's not going to be able to run over tough Borland. And if he has a lead blocker, you know, tough Borland is fine hitting the fullback in the hole and uh, letting his other guys take care of the running back. Yeah. <laughs> you just don't play that that much anymore. And he's just, he was always such a liability in pass coverage. So I the biggest question, and we're going to get an answer this year. And either everybody is going to a guy like Mitchell's going to get on the field, and you're going to get one to two reactions from Ohio State fans. The first reaction is going to be, "Why the hell did you let Tough play for all these years? This guy is a million times better." The other reactions on the field have been like, "Why can't you recruit middle linebackers? Because it looks like this guy can't. This guy shouldn't have been on the field neither." Well, that's what I'm saying. I don't even know if he's gonna be the middle linebacker. He might be the will. Yeah, because then with Ohio State system too, Will's an inside guy. Yeah, and the, they're they're interchangeable. They they practice this together. Right. Sam's the only true outside linebacker yeah. for Ohio State's team. So yeah, there's a lot of questions there because you know, tough. I mean, he tough coming into this draft was a sixth to seventh round guy to begin with. And, you know, his pro day wasn't that great. And, you know, at least on the measurable parts of it, but again, what are you looking for? I mean, he could still get drafted by a team that, you know, that's still a, they want that type of benefit that they're not, a, they're not expecting their middle linebacker, even, you know, Baltimore doesn't, their middle linebackers a lot of times they'll go out into pass coverage that they're, they stay more down towards the line of scrimmage. Yeah. Or maybe, May you could use tough in those type of situations. Are you in a, con- a division that runs the ball a little bit more? You know, he could work out maybe in the AFC South, you know, but he might not get drafted because of his pro day. I don't, I mean, I, I said from the beginning of the year, I don't think tough's getting drafted. So yeah. And like I said, I, I think the earliest he would have went sixth round. He was probably more like a seventh round guy, but yeah, he could be an undrafted kid, but seventh round guys can easily be drafted as they could be He'll yeah. get invited to go work out for a team. Yeah. So, and he'll definitely be picked up on a roster. I mean, it'll just then whether he can make a team or not right. in season. Um, but so there's concerns now because like, should one of these guys in the mind. So were the Ohio state coaches were Al Washington and uh, the guys before him, were they open-minded the left, let Taraja Mitchell and these guys passed these guys or were they so close-minded that, you know, there's always loyalty that they were loyal to these guys. And one thing that scares me about that group, Al Washington had no loyalty to Pete Warner, tough Borland and Barrett. Browning. They weren't his guys. They weren't his guys. They recruit them. And, I could say Browning and Warner definitely still deserve to be on the playing field. They were probably the two best linebackers in the program, but you know, does, you know, he didn't have no loyalty to tough Borland tough Borland still ends up being the starter. And so, I mean, I don't know. So that, that group, that, that group, especially, um, I believe it's, um, is Pope the true outside guy or is he the one that works in? No, Co- yeah. Kayvon Pope's an outside guy. Okay. I think he's a Sam. So Gant and Gant and, so, Gant and Mitchell are kind of Will Mike both. So why, why couldn't they pass tough? And that's, 
I think a question mark that's going to really be interesting to see it get answered this year yeah. because are they good enough to be the starters or now if one, are the, one of these young guys going to pass them up? Right. Yeah, I know. It's, it's an interesting conversation. I mean, we've heard so many good things and that's, and maybe it's just because these guys have been there for so long. And now like a couple of weeks ago, you know, he wasn't biting on the question if Dallas Gant was going to be the starter, if he was healthy or not. He said he wasn't going to get tricked like that to talk about the depth chart. He said Dallas would definitely be in the mix if he was healthy right now, that he yeah. would be taking snaps with the ones for the, you know, I think will. So yeah, but he, he didn't say one way or the other. We don't know what's going on. If like the bullets ever going to be something that they use more or not. I mean, I think it's probably not a bad idea to try to transition your defense that way because you do get Clemson and Alabama's at the end of the day. Like yeah. I think Ohio state has enough talent and they're tough enough. And you know, they're a bigger, stronger team than who they're facing. Anyways, I think they can stop the run against Wisconsin. If they get them in a big 10 championship game, even if they are running a different defense, that's more catered to stopping the pass. You can change it up for a week. And I think they got, they got the tools. They got the guys. There the the defense they ran in 2002 was not the defense they ran against Wisconsin and the big 10 championship game. Melvin Gordon, they ran basically a four. They ran a very heavy four, three to a heavy four, four, that whole game. Yeah. And you know, and it was all about, we're just, they knew they can't throw the ball on us. I mean, Wisconsin's a little different now with well, the he quarterback. Still doesn't, I don't know if he still has like the receiving threats. They still don't have, even if they have Graham Mertz, they don't have the other guys on the outside that are going to stress Ohio state that much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these younger guys, so we've talked a little bit about Eichenberg. Do you think one of these, these freshmen, do you think a couple of the young guys, Craig young, uh, are these guys, guys there's a couple uh, names that have been really popping. I mean, in Craig the young's name was mentioned a lot last year. Craig young. I think, I think Craig young's the body type that Al Washington really likes too. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think Craig Young definitely, you know, you hear his name a lot. Kid's an athletic freak. Like, I think that definitely if he's learning what he's supposed to be doing on the field, I think he makes a strong push to get some really legitimate playing time. I just, Tommy Eichenberg, it stands out to me how much he was praised. Like, Tommy Eichenberg was, he's kind of like an afterthought. He wasn't a guy you thought about. It was just like, you kind of needed some middle linebacker depth and you got you were able to pull the kid out of Boston college, but he's the guy they're talking about. Yeah. So, which that kind of scares me too. Cause when I looked at Tommy Eichenberg, I don't necessarily see tough Borland, but I see some guy that he's a big 10 middle linebacker that, you know, he's physical and he'll come up and he'll smash skulls with you. Yeah. He might be, if, but if he's more, if he's just, if he's, if he's a little bit more athletic than tough was, then, you know, he, that could still work. Yeah. Is even in the Big Ten, even with the you're playing different things, you could have a middle linebacker that comes up and smash goals. He just he's also gonna be able to turn his hips and go backwards, and you know. And then I mean, Mitchell Milton hasn't been talked about as much. Cody Simon, though, and even if you've seen the kid, I mean, he is jacked up. Like that kid is definitely a workout warrior. But they're talking about him too in the press conferences. They're yeah. saying what he's doing. That he's just he's been a machine out there. Yeah. So, yeah, so we got a lot of interesting things. So I think the biggest interesting thing is going to be our coming out of spring. Do these three guys that have been in the program for such a long time. Do they transition themselves that they're now the starters or at the end of the day is one and two of them possibly going to be looking to leave the program because, you know, to go somewhere where they can get playing time because they get passed up by one of these young guys. And I mean, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see because there were some things and I think some of our some of my issues with tough has kind of been uh validated that you know should one of these guys have passed him yeah and that's where I, that's what i'm saying that's kind of what i was scared about too like why didn't one of these guys pass him yeah, so, they're athletically they are more gifted than tough and i think is. we'll we'll answer that some of that will get answered next year they did because, say you know taraja mitchell is down like 20 pounds as well yeah, so that. so he's probably moving quicker yeah be interesting all right, you got anything else you want to throw in? You want to do a depth? Or you want to do a projection on linebacker? I mean, I don't know because <laughs> I don't know who's going to go. And I, I, I still don't know enough about the young guys. I want to hear a little bit more what the coaches say about them. But All right, we'll, we'll, we'll see how the spring game I, goes. I would, do a, I would like to do an end of spring game depth chart after we see the spring game. See how these guys actually play with live bullets out there. Yeah. Okay, I'm good with that. No, I'm good. 
Nothing else. All right. Well, we'll get on out of there with that. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming out today to the Buckeye Bar. I'm John. And I'm Mike. O-H-I-O. Thank you for tuning in to this week's Buckeye Bar, guys, on Buckeye Bar Talk. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Hit that all notifications bell so you see when new content is added. And please remember to like and share so we can grow our audience. Uh, Don't be afraid to comment. We want to know what you're thinking, and we want to know what content to add for you guys. O-H-I-O.